Welcome to the Global Prayer Network, with Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. We pray this teaching will impact your life, and bring you closer in your walk with Jesus. Let's get ready to receive today's teaching from, Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us to this place once again. We are here not because we have nothing to do or trying to be religious. We are simply trying to be obedient. Because your word said in Psalm number 55, 16 to 17, that we must pray in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. And so, God, we thank you right now that we are here. You know what each of us are standing in need of. And we thank you that you promised in your word to supply not some all of our needs according to your riches by Christ Jesus. And so we thank you. Bless us now and cause us to be a blessing. In the name of Jesus of Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. But the word of God is central to the healthy family. As we said to you in the beginning, there are no perfect family. You will not find a single family on planet Earth that can claim absolute perfection. And when we talk about perfection, it's not just in morality, but every aspect of your life your health, your finances, your relationship to others, your relationship to God, your relationship sometimes even to yourself. And so when we talk about perfection, it's not what we think of just holy, perfect, etc. No. We're talking about the totality of your life. You will not find a perfect family, especially following Genesis chapter 3. Now, prior to Genesis chapter 3, you could find one, Adam and Eve. After Genesis chapter 3, you no longer had a perfect family. You had now either a sick family, a healthy family, a growing family, a stagnated family, a family not doing so well at all. How do we regenerate the family? How do we put the family back on track? Sometimes when you're traveling, you uh, miss your turn and you go in the wrong direction. I remember some time ago, I was coming out of Charlotte. Charlotte is a city in North Carolina on my way to Winston-Salem where we reside. And I was so focused on some thoughts, I believe, and I missed my turn. I did. And I found myself in places that I was wondering, how did I get here? Have you ever asked yourself the question in your life's journey, how did I get here? We got here by missing the turn. We got here by focusing on other things. We got here by being distracted. We got here by losing focus. God wants every family to do very well. God really does. God wants every family to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue, to have dominion. Even Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God wants every family to do well. But sometimes we get distracted. We lose focus. We allow people to discombobulate our thoughts. 
We forget who we are. We listen to what others have to say about us. And we gravitate toward them much more than we gravitate to what God said about you. I used to tell the congregation all the time, when people call you names and people say some things about you, don't react. Don't respond until you go and you check the book and see what does the book say about you. When some people say that you came from apes, you came from animals and that kind of thing, just go check the book and then go back and tell them you are wrong because I talked to the creator and the creator says something else. You are demented individual. You don't know all. I just talked to the one who's all knowing, the one who's all powerful. I read his book. I read his instructions. And he told me otherwise. When folk tell you you're a number of failure, you're going to fail. Your mama was a failure. Your daddy was a failure. You're going to fail too. So, okay, let me go check the book. And once you check the book, you'll soon discover that God said, hallelujah, you are designed, you're created to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. As a matter of fact, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are God's masterpiece. Stop allowing people to cause you to be distracted. Stop it. Stop it. You know how you can tell if people have distracted you? When you begin to lose your joy, when you begin to lose your peace, when you begin to lose your happiness in the Lord, that's how you can tell you've been distracted. Because the man said, the spirit said, God said, he will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. I didn't say that. He said that. He will keep you in perfect peace. And so it is the trick of the enemy. It's actually one of the tricks of the enemy to cause us to be focused on other things. You know, on your bills. Yeah, you gotta focus on your bills, but talk to God. Talk to God about your bills. Talk to God about your health. Talk to God about your relationships, your children, your family. Talk to God. What's the need of sitting and worrying? I think it must have been Albert Einstein, you know, one of that, that noted physicist who said that the thought, the idea, the concepts that got you into a situation cannot be the same concept, ideas that would take you out of it. This is how one of our children put it once upon a time. His name is Solomon. Solomon asked the question, he said, the devil always causes you to get into trouble, but he can't get you out. And that's the truth. The devil will lead you in paths of unrighteousness, make you think you're doing well. That's what the Bible said. There is a way that simmered right onto a person, but the end is death. The only person that can get us out of the destitution of depravity is Jesus. And that's why we need the word of God. We need the word of God in our family, our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren must know the word of God. Why? Because Wherever the word of God is, the Holy Spirit is going to be there to guide us, to direct us, to order our steps. So when you said, you asked the question, 
What is the purpose of the word of God in the life of the believer? What good is the word of God in the life of the believer? Let me say this. First of all, the word of God tells us about Jesus. The word of God makes us wise unto salvation. See, sometimes we don't know, you know, I think you've heard it before, like a frog, a frog in the water and it starts getting warm, warm, warm and getting hot, hot, hot and doesn't realize it's in hot water. That's how sometimes it is in life. You find yourself going deeper, 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 deeper until you're way at the bottom and then realize you're going deeper and you realize that you no longer have air, you no longer have light, you, you, you're down to the very bottom. How did that happen? You got distracted. So the word of God tells us about how we can become wise unto salvation. The word of God brings about regeneration. When you talk about regeneration, what are we talking about? There are times in our lives when you're wiped out. I mean, just wiped out. You have nothing else to give. You've given everything, every gratitude. You, you just wiped out. If you haven't gotten to that stage in your life, it's a good indication you're not living your dream. You're not living God's purpose for your life because there comes a time, even Jesus at one point got tired. You remember that passage in John chapter four when Jesus was sitting at the well? Oh yeah, he was tired. He sent his disciples, go give me some food. He was tired. But he was the kind of individual who never allowed himself to get to the place to get so tired that he didn't have time to minister. It was at that time that the lady came and we had that tremendous conversation and we learned that God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The word of God is our spiritual milk. You know, every baby needs milk. No child is born eating stick and filling me on. No hamburger and hot dogs, chicken, etc. No, we start off with the milk. And the word of God is our spiritual milk. Yes, the word of God is the believer's bread. We need milk, we need bread. And that's the word of God. The word of God makes us complete. If you want to be complete in the things of God, it's in the word of God. I said, first of all, the word of God tells us about Jesus. We find that in John chapter 5 and verse 39. John chapter 5 verse 39 tells us that the word tells us about Jesus. The word of God makes us wise unto salvation. We find that in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. The word of God brings about regeneration. We find that in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. The word of God is the believer's milk, spiritual milk. We find that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. And the word of God is the believer's bread of life. We find that in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. And we said the word of God makes us complete. It's not our degree that we hang on the wall. I've never heard that the Holy Spirit will look at your degree and tell you what to say. Mm -mm. It is the word of God. It's not even our material possessions. No. Our material possessions can sometimes give us a skewed understanding of life. You know, Jesus gave the parable about this uh, rich man. This rich man who, uh, you know, looked upon his material wealth and he said, look what good I have done to myself. We have a, a plenty. I'm going to tear down this small barn and 
Build me a bigger barn. I mean, folk will pass by my house and say, what a wealthy man. And Jesus said that very night, that very, very night, he didn't even realize it was the last of his life. And his soul was required of him. So even our material possessions do not make us complete. No, they do not. The other day, there was this rich man in America by the name of Warren Buffett. Some of you may have heard the name. He was saying that when he dies, all of his billions and billions of dollars, he will put in a trust fund to be used to help the poor. A good thing, but he's, he's, he's observing the shadows of his mortality. And he's realizing that billions of dollars cannot stop him from entering the shadowy gates of death. And so he's beginning to come to terms with the fact that, hmm, okay, this thing is it's kind of real. You know, his good friend and associate Munga that's going on. And so he realizes, you know, the Bible said it, it is appointed unto a man once to die, but then afterwards comes the judgment. And so we have to live a complete life. And how do we live a complete life? We live a complete life by, in fact, the word of God. And so today we want to look at the word of God in the family. We want to encourage you to make a commitment. You remember some time ago, I'm not sure if you remember in one of our lessons and, uh, you know, long, long time ago when we'll be teaching, we'll talk about the need for having a vision, having a mission to set goals, to have objectives. And all of those things are good. But what I've discovered that even before you have a vision, even before you have goals, even if you have a mission, even if before you have objectives, the first thing you need is called commitment. Commitment. You have to first make up your mind. Because if your mind is not made up, if you're not a committed individual, God will give you ideas. God will give you visions. God will give you dreams. God will put a mission in your path and you will do nothing about it. Because you're not committed. You see, when you're committed, hmm, there will be days that you won't feel like it. But you say, I got to go. I got to go. There will be days you don't want to. But you will say, I got to go. There will be times in your life when you not want to do it. For example, one of those simplistic things in the word of God where Jesus said, you know, love your enemy. Love your enemy. There are times you don't want to do that. Why should I love somebody who doesn't like me? Somebody who spends their day and night trying to undermine me. Somebody who spends all of their days trying to destroy me. And God, you tell me, love them. Let's be for real, oh Heavenly Father. Thou art great, thou art wonderful, but let's be real now, Father. You want me to love them? Commitment to the word of God says, yes, love them. So commitment is extremely important, whatever you want. So I've come to discover something, and I will share it with you. The first is commitment. You got to be committed. Got to be committed. That's what Jesus meant when he said, who will want to build a house and you do not, first of all, sit down and count the cost? Commitment. The second thing that is important before you even get to vision, dreams, goals, etc., is a renewal of your mind. Renewal of your mind. Let me give you a little secret. There is nothing you 
want in life that you cannot have if you renew your mind in the direction of what you need. For example, none of us were born with the word of God. We learn the word of God by studying the word of God, etc. So if you want to know more about the word of God, and here again is another trick of the enemy, knowing the word of God is not just knowing it for knowing the sick. The word of God is a map. The word of God is our GPS. The question is map to where, map to where, map to where. The word of God is a map for us to go after the will of God, the ways of God, go after fellowship with God. If the word of God is not bringing you closer to God, you must be reading the wrong map. You know, some of you can remember yesteryears when you had to travel, you were called AAA and ask them to map out your route. Today, you just sit in your car, press the button, and somebody comes on and say, well, how can I help you? You say, give me directions. And they send you directions. Now, think about it. You are down here in the South. Somebody somewhere, we don't even know where. And you press the button. And it comes on. Ring. Can I help you? Yes. Directions to X, Y, Z. And in seconds, directions to X, Y, Z will take you nine miles, ten miles. Sending directions. If we can do that, what about God? What about God? That's what the scripture says. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. If I can press a button. And nowadays when I go somewhere, I don't know where I'm going. I just press the button. Mm, can I help you? Yes, directions to X, Y, Z. The address. Sending you directions. The same it is with God. Father, I'm in trouble. I need to get out of trouble. How will I happen? Send you directions. God, I need a deliverance from this situation. Send you directions. God, I'm tired. I need strength. Send you directions. Yes. Talk to God. Ah! He would give you directions to where you need to go. So the first thing is commitment to live by the word of God. That's important. When you commit yourself to the word of God, it helps you to pursue God through his word. That's what I want to talk about briefly. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. I want to show you how the early, early disciples committed themselves to living by the word of God. We are here today in 20 and 24, and there are some 2 billion people who follow Jesus Christ. And how did that happen? It happened because of some people somewhere who decided that they would be committed to living their life according to the word of God. And I want to encourage you. If you want your children and your children's children to do well, even while you are under the earth, your body is under the earth, but your spirit is with God. You want your children to do well. I want to encourage you today to make a commitment to living your life according to the word of God. Because when you live your life according to the word of God, your children will see it. Your children will hear you praying. Your children will hear you quoting scripture. Your children will know where you get your strength from. 
And when they themselves are in challenging moments, they too will turn to the word of God. They will turn to prayers. They will turn to fasting. They will turn to making sacrifices unto God. Listen to this. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 41. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 41. It says here, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. What we have here is what we're talking about today, and that is our household, our children, our families. If we want to experience the supernatural move of God, then we have to be committed. Committed to what? Committed to the word of God. When you are committed to the word of God, it does something. And your commitment is not just what you say, but what you do. That's commitment. Commitment is not so much what you say, it's actually what you do. Because it's easy to say. I had a presiding elder many, many years ago. He said, talk is cheap. It takes money to buy land. <laughs> he is called the lit Dr. Ciara Thompson. You know, those of you who are Christian education workers in the Amy Zion Church, when you hear that benediction, every Christian worker, every worker, something like that, he was the one who formulated those words. He said, talk is cheap. It takes money to buy land. So, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And so we find here that they that gladly receive the word of God, I hope you can underline that word gladly, because you cannot receive the word grumbling, complaining. You know, some of the old, old time teachers, when they used to write on the chalkboard, when they come to the class in the morning, they will put all of the information that is supposed to be done for that day. And it will give you a certain time to write it in your notebook. And after that particular time, if you have not written it in your notebook, the, the board will be erased. It's gone. Except you have to ask somebody else to help you now. What are we saying? You have time to do something. And in that particular time that you have to do it, you've got to do it like a student. 
a student is going to class to do what? Learn by writing, by reading, by doing something. A student needs a particular kind of attitude. When you go to class, you have to have a certain kind of attitude, an attitude that says, I'm here to learn. The same it is with us and the word of God. What is the attitude that we must have when it comes to the word of God? According to the scripture, the attitude should be a glad attitude. Anything you do for God must be done with a glad attitude. Oh, here we go again. Oh, here again. And you're complaining and complaining. You know what complaining does? Complaining erases what the teacher put on the board. Complaining erases God's plan for your life. If you don't believe it, read the book. When you read the book of Exodus, when God liberated the people from Egypt, out there in the wilderness, they complain, they complain, they complain, they complain, they argue, they grumble, they complain, they argue, they grumble. And God said, okay, if that's the way it's going to be, trip is canceled. And do you know, 600 plus thousand folk left Egypt and didn't make it to the promised land because they were complaining. They were grumbling, complaining. I have no, I, I have no contradictory thought. I believe it in my heart. When Dr. King said, I've seen the promised land. He said, I may not get there with you, but I've seen the day when black little children and white little children will walk together. I've seen the day when you will no longer be judged by the color of your skin, but by the content of your character. I see it. Well, That day is, is still coming. Some things have been achieved. But what if we were to stop complaining as much as we do? What if we stop fighting each other as much as we do? What if we were to stop undermining each other as much as we do? And the thing about it is, we are all in the church. We all call ourselves Christians. Where is the joy? Many of us have lost the joy of our salvation. Church has become burdensome. Oh, here they go again. This money, money, money thing. Here they go again. Prayer meeting, here they go again. Another revival, here they go again. And we complain and complain and complain. And God says, okay, if that's how you're going to do it, trip is canceled. Blessings are canceled. Sanctification canceled. All of your opportunities, cancel, start on your own. So the attitude that we must bring to the things of God is a glad attitude. It says, yeah, then they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them 3,000 souls. And listen to this. And they continued. They continued. That's why I want to thank some of you who have continued 6 a.m. 12 noon in the evening at 7 o'clock. You have continued because that is what it's going to take for you to experience the fullness of God's grace, God's mercy upon your life. It says, and they continued steadfastly. They were not casual about it. They were steadfast, unmovable. They were steadfast. They were committed. They were steadfast. In the morning, at noon, in the evening, every hour, they were steadfast. What were they doing? They were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, that is the teachings, in the fellowship, that is helping each other, living together in harmony, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. My sisters and my brothers, you know what happened when we conduct ourselves that way? And it says, and the fear came upon every soul. The fear, what is the fear? Is the reverence for God. Do you know why some of our churches are not experiencing 
the miracles of God because we don't have any respect for God. No respect. Some of you can remember how the old folk used to tell children, get away from that pulpit, get away from that altar. It's not that they were trying to be mean and you know ugly, but they saw that area as holy. They saw it as a place to be reverential. That's not a playground. But today we've gone from casual to casual because of no fear for God. You see, one of the things, one of the ways that we come to know and experience God for his fullness is when we have reverence for God, when we fear God, when we honor God. It says here, and fear came upon every soul. They became very reverential. They had respect for God. And as a result, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. We got to get back. We got to get back. We got to get back to the reverence for God, the respect for God. The only thing that does, it, it, it helps us. When we, when we approach God in the manner that God is to be approached, then God says, okay, I'm, I'm welcome in this place. None of us want to go to a place where we're disrespected, ignored, what more about God? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why some of our churches are dried up is seats 400, but we only have about 30 people showing up on a good day. Why? We don't respect God. And God will not come to a place where he's disrespected. Mm -mm. When we reverence God, when we honor God, when we give God the glory that he's due, God will show up. Why did the scripture says he inhabits the praise of his people? When we honor God, you know, some of the mistakes we made, the respect we're supposed to have for God, we give it to some man or some woman. And the respect we're supposed to have for them, that's what we're giving to God. So we treat God casually. But I want you to know there is an attitude with which we come before God. And there's some things we do to make our families wholesome when the word of God is present. And we will continue on Monday by the grace of God. I will stop here.